it again next week. Well, again, good morning. And anticipating that uh, a lot of people would be away today, as it looks like we are correct, uh, I thought I'd take our time in the world today, in the world, <laughs> in the word today, we are in the world also, but in the word today to cover a topic that's typically heavy on a pastor's heart, and that is the topic of religious unbelief. Now, at the outset, as I talk about this today, I, I want to say that I'm not preaching this as if I feel like we have a room full of this, but I also preach this from the context of what it is we'll learn about this topic. And as a starting point, it, it may be a term that you're unfamiliar with, or maybe something you haven't heard before. So I thought I'd just start by telling you what it means, and then we'll begin to look at the topic itself. So here's how I define it. Religious unbelief is the absence of authentic faith manifested by an external show of religious activity in various different forms, but a heart that is far from God. Okay, so let me say that again. It's an absence of an authentic saving faith manifested or shown or revealed by an external show of religious activity in many different forms but a heart that is far from God. And I think Audrey's song, uh, Sufficient Merit, is actually at the core of this message here today. Isaiah himself affirms this definition in chapter 29 and verse 13 when he says, Then the Lord said, This people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but they remove their hearts far from me. So again, the context of an external show of religiosity, but an internal heart that is far from God. Now, religious believers, unbelievers may confess Jesus as Lord. They may have all the right doctrinal understandings, and they may truly believe they're saved, but our passage today is going to tell us that none of these things, and I want to key on this next word, none of these things alone, none of these things alone, assure the authenticity of someone's faith. And I do think, sadly, that we will be surprised when we learn who some of these people are, because many of them will exhibit all of the qualities we would normally associate with a Christian, but the reality is that they are self-deceived, and they have a false assurance of their eternal destiny, which again, as I started, is why it weighs heavy on a pastor's heart. So that's why I'm choosing to go through this today. Now, you might be thinking two things right out of the box here. The first being, wow, Pastor Steve, are you being judgmental? And the second might be, where does the Bible say this? And let me assure you that both of these are fair questions, and they're fair things to come to your mind. So to the first, let me just say that I'm motivated by love for the eternal destiny of those who God has given me to shepherd. So as a pastor, it is always on my heart to make sure that people have made a genuine expression of faith and they understand what that means biblically and it's out of a motivation for love out of, as opposed to any motivation to be judgmental. Now for the second question, what I'd like you to do is turn with me to our passage for today, which we find in Matthew chapter, 20, or chapter 7. Matthew's Gospel chapter 7 and verses 21 to 23. So Matthew 7... 21 to 23. Now, in these three verses, where Jesus is going to warn us about the terrifying truth of religious unbelief. The terrifying truth about religious unbelief. And he's going to say three things, one each in each of the three verses. In verse 21, we're going to see the reality of religious unbelief. So there is such a thing, and verse 21 will show us that Jesus himself says there's such a thing. In verse 22, we're going to see the response of religious unbelief, which will be quite remarkable when I point out to you the setting of this response. And then finally, in verse 23, we'll look at the result, or maybe perhaps the verdict, but I couldn't come up with an R word for that. So the result of religious unbelief in verse 23. Okay, so the reality of it, the response of it, and the result of religious unbelief. So follow along with me, if you would please, as I read verses 21 to 23. 
Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name do many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice or work lawlessness. So let me start by just giving us a little context about these verses, because we are parachuting right into the middle of a part of the Bible. And the context is, of course, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which begins in chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel and extends all the way through chapter 7. Now this is Jesus' longest recorded discourse in the Bible, and his focus is on the character of those who are in the kingdom of heaven, or as I began earlier, those who have authentic saving faith. And he talks about the character. It's kind of like the, the Christian constitution, if you will, if you want to think of it that way. Now, having revealed the character of authentic faith, Jesus concludes the sermon here with three warnings. And these three warnings function as tests for the authenticity of our faith. Now, the Apostle John writes a whole letter, 1 John, on this topic. James also kind of deals with it in his letter. And again, um, if you think of John's purpose in 1 John, what he says is, I write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. So he's concerned about their assurance and he's giving them some tests. So Jesus at the end of this sermon is giving three functional tests to help us to evaluate it. Now the first test is in verse 13 and 14 and he's using an illustration of two gates, the broad gate and the narrow gate. And in this one he's focusing on the crowd that we run with. That's the way that I think about that. Do we associate and identify with the masses who are on the broad road to destruction, moving towards the broad gate, or are we among the minority who reject the ways of the world in favor of faith and obedience to Christ? That is the narrow gate that leads to eternal life. The second test comes in 15, verses 15 to 20, and while the first test was about who we are associating with, the second test, using an agricultural metaphor, focuses on who we follow. Who are we looking to for direction? And the advice and the, uh, the warning that he gives us here is to make sure that we are submitting ourselves and following people who demonstrate the fruit of, uh, true, of true leadership or true teaching in the process. So first test, who are you associating with? Second test, who is it that you are placing your faith in and following? And now in verses 21 to 23, we have the third warning where Jesus identifies another kind of deception that we should watch for. And this is one that I think is far more common and far more dangerous. And that is self-deception. Self-deception. Now, self-deception is way more dangerous because we are all susceptible to this trap. All of us are susceptible to this trap. And the outcome of being deceived about your salvation is indeed terrifying. Now, there's a Puritan writer that I like a lot. His name is J.C. Ryle. What he says about this third warning is, in it we move from false prophets, that's what he was warning against in 15 to 20, who we're following, to false professions of faith. False professions of faith. So with that, in the context set, what I'd like to do is take a look at this first aspect of it, which is the reality of religious unbelief, which again we find in verse 20, 10, 21. So note again how Jesus starts this warning. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Now, as I walk through these verses, please don't just turn me out, uh, tune me out, but rather heed the Apostle Paul's warning. He gives us a similar warning in 2 Corinthians 13 as he closes the letter in verse 5, when he tells us to test ourselves to see if we are in the faith. 
And then he concludes, examine yourselves. So I don't want anybody here to have a morbid preoccupation about your salvation. But like Paul, I think it's always good to examine the foundation of our faith from time to time to ensure that we have an authentic saving faith. And we need to do this because I think Jesus very clearly tells us right here that not everyone who claims to be a Christian is really a Christian and really will enter heaven. Now, for those of you in a Taiwanese context, you don't really understand this, but in an American context, if you were to poll an average American, probably four out of five would tell you that they are Christian. And all you think you have to do is look at our nation right now. And you know that can't be true. But the fact is that a mere profession that you are a Christian or a claim of being a Christian does not ensure that you are. And Jesus says, not everyone who says this is going to enter into eternal life. So, kind of first question is, is there such a thing as religious unbelief? And I think Jesus surely seems to think so. And what he's going to do in this first part, in verse 21 entirely, is give us four measures to help us test the authenticity of our faith. The so four measures he's going to give us to test it. Now the first three are going to be found in the opening words of verse 21, or the first half of it, and they express three measures of inadequate faith. So three inadequate marks of authentic faith. And these are marks that fall short of a faith that Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. So the first of these inadequate ones is a confession of faith alone. And we see it in these words. Jesus says, not everyone who says, okay, not everyone who says. So in other words, not everyone who claims some affiliation with, some association to, some confession of Christ, which will be Lord, Lord, and we'll look at that in a second, not everyone who says this is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. So simply stated, authentic faith is more than just a confession alone. I'm going to say that word alone many, many times again. Now, it's more than just claiming Christ's name, but here's the paradox, or maybe here's the tension. Though a confession is required part of authentic faith, is it not? What, what does Paul say in Romans chapter 10? You have to what? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and you will be saved. So here we are saying it, it, it's not a confession, and that's why I'm using this word alone. It's not a confession alone. But yet, a confession is a required part of an authentic faith. Now, this may sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my, my mouth, so what do I mean by that? So first, on the inadequate side, I think what Jesus is saying is, saying is something like this. If you're basing your salvation exclusively on some prayer you prayed or some experience you had, or maybe a response to an altar call, then you might want to question the authenticity of your faith. Now, I underscore this word might. I'm not saying you are or are not, but you might want to say that. There was a German during World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a Christian, and he did a lot to try to counteract Hitler, uh, pay for it with his life, but he famously calls this cheap grace. And it's characterized by what I, something I call is easy believism, which is simply a confession of faith with no correspondent change in how you live your life. Okay, so a confession of faith with no change in how you live your life. You can't just pray a prayer and say, I'm all good, and keep on living the way you've lived all the way before and have an assurance and a confidence that that prayer is going to to save you. Now, just to, by way of self-disclosure, this was certainly true of my own life. Now, I've shared my testimony in that it was later in life that I came to faith, but in college, I did respond to an altar call. 
for somebody I was dating. She was a professed Christian. She said, I got to go to church. I said, okay, I'll go to church. And went enough times with her to then one day they made the altar call. So for those of you in Taiwan that may not know what that means, it means that the pastor at the end of the service invites people to come forward and accept Jesus and as their, as their Lord and Savior. So for whatever reason, there was one of those days when I found myself getting up out of my seat. I went forward. I prayed a prayer. And he told me he prayed the prayer. And I got the pats on the head. Okay, you're great. You're all good. And for 30 years, my life didn't change a bit. It just didn't change. So I look back at that and I say, gosh, what... Was I genuinely saved? Well, based upon what we're looking at here this morning, I, I don't think so. And if the Lord had chosen to take me before then, or before 48, when I do believe I was genuinely saved, then I was placing my hope and my faith in something that wasn't sufficient or was inadequate as authentic faith. Okay, so the first of these inadequate things is this confession of faith alone is inadequate Yet remember my paradox, but it is, of course, part of genuine faith. Now, the second of these is the content of the confession alone. The content of the confession alone. And that, that is inadequate. And here's our attention, the attention again. The content or the words of what you're confessing alone, 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 I'll repeat that, is inadequate though we surely need to have the right doctrine. Correct? We, we have to believe the right things, but believing the right things alone, Jesus is going to tell us, is an inadequate uh, measure of authentic saving faith. Now, here's how he says that. The, the people that he is speaking to or addressing, he is saying, call him Lord. Okay, so not everyone who says, Lord. Now, this is a theologically loaded word. Anybody calling Jesus Lord at that time was acknowledging both his deity, they were saying, you are God, and they were submitting to his rightful rule over their life. So they were making a doctrinally rich confession a doctrinally correct confession about their faith. Okay? Yet, Jesus says that this alone is not an authentic saving faith. So their confession was correctly submitting to the proper authority and the only one who could save. Now moving on, the final inadequate mark is found in the repetition of the word Lord. He says, not only one, everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So whenever you see a word repeated in the Bible, three times particularly in the Old Testament, and twice in the New Testament, it's the biblical writer's way of, of expressing passionate intensity or zeal in what they're saying. So the third inadequate mark is that uh, of authentic faith is a fervency or a zeal of your confession alone. Okay, so you can make a confession, you can say the right things, your life can show a spiritual vibrancy and a fervency, but Jesus is saying that this alone is not an adequate expression of authentic faith. And one more time for our attention, yet as a genuine believer, just as Audrey dearly shared with us this morning, there should be a fervency in our faith. There should be a fervency, a zeal in our love that comes out, okay, as a Christian. So it alone isn't the thing that marks you as saved, but it is a mark of a genuine Christian. So putting all these three things together, these apparent contradictions or paradoxes that I've emphasized, here's what Jesus tells us about the inadequate marks of, it, of authentic faith. He says, it's not based on a confession alone, though that is a part. He says, it's not based on the content alone, that is right doctrine, though that is a part. And it's not based on spiritual zeal alone, but that 
itself is a part. So, now they've spent all that time emphasizing it. Okay, Jesus, what then is the measure of authentic faith? Well, look at the last part of 21, verse 21, where he's going to resolve the tension, and he's going to note what he says about who will inherit eternal life. So note what he says again. He says, not everyone, okay, that, doesn't, that means some will, okay, who say these things, but not everyone who says these things, meaning Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but, so we have a contrast, who will? He who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Okay, so, what is the mark of authentic faith? Thoughts? Any thoughts? What's the mark of authentic faith, then? As in terms of Jesus' words here, what's he saying? How would, might you synthesize that? Can you think of two words? Okay, that's the one word. Absolutely correct. And I'm going to append that with an adjective. Persistent obedience. Okay? Jesus says that persistent obedience is the mark of authentic faith. Now, obedience to what? Well, he says it right there, the will of God. Well, what does that look like? Well, we could have chosen a ton of passages, but I'm going to choose this one. So stick your finger in Matthew here, and let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and look at verses 1 and 2. I think this is as good an expression or summary expression of the will of God as we can get without reading a ton of passages. So Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul says this. After 11 chapters of the deepest and fullest doctrine of salvation, Paul is going to spend the last four chapters, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, five chapters, um, uh, telling us how to live out our life based on that. And here's what he says, well-known verses, I'm sure, to all of you. Therefore, therefore what? Everything I just told you. I exhort you, brothers by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and, here's my favorite word, pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve what the will of God is. Okay, what is that? That which is good and pleasing and perfect. So what's the will of God? That which is good, that which is pleasing, pleasing to who? Pleasing to God, and that which is perfect. So what's the standard? Well, it's perfect, and that's kind of a hard one to get to. All right? So turn back, if you would, to Matthew's Gospel, if you uh, go back there. Persistent obedience to the will of God, then, is this essential mark that Jesus wants his hearers to hear regarding measuring the authenticity of your faith. Luke says it this way in 646 in his parallel passage. Now why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So it's completely inconsistent to Jesus and a total non-starter for you to be claiming him as Lord and not doing what he tells you to do. So again, much more succinct way to say the same thing and not leaving the tension. So, as we leave verse 22, I, I do want to kind of highlight three things, because I think there can be some confusion here that we have to be careful with. First of all, Jesus is not promoting here a works-based salvation. In fact, he's not teaching about salvation itself in terms of how that occurs at all. But rather, what he's teaching about is how to know whether your faith is authentic. Now, I don't know if this ever goes through your heads, but there are certainly times in my life when I stop and say, man, are you, are you really saved? I mean, look at all the mess you make of things all the time. And, and I have to stop and think about it. Usually it's the Lord's and Holy Spirit's way of getting my attention and perhaps pointing out something I need to confess and stop doing and repent of. But there are certainly times when this question comes to my mind, and I'm encouraged by verses like this so it's giving us kind of these measures of authenticity. It's not telling you how you're saved. It's telling you how you can evaluate the authenticity of your faith. 
Now, turn again to another passage, because this is the whole point that James makes in a very controversial passage. So put your finger in Matthew and turn back to James chapter 2. And James is going to just tackle this thing very head on, this idea of works and faith. Okay, James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. Let me read through there. James says, What use is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? So, where's the starting point? Starting point is, there is a non-authentic faith. There is a faith that says it's a faith. But he's going to go on and say, how can that faith save him if it's all it is you're saying? If a brother or sister is without clothing, so he's going to give us an illustration, and in need of daily food, and if one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Right? Now, I, I'm not sure any of us do that, but let me tell you one of the practical ways that we do that is when we say, well, I'll pray for you. And then what happens? Goes in one ear, picks up speed, goes out the other ear. You know, so you've told him you're going to pray for him. Did you pray for him? So here we go. You're doing it in a physical need sense. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Okay, so he's starting to develop his argument. He's saying there's no contradiction in these two things. And in fact, the evidence of an authentic faith is a faith that is working itself out in practical things. You believe that God is one, you do well. Okay, what's that? Good doctrine, right? That's good doctrine. What does he say? The demons also believe and they shudder. But you're willing to recognize, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac as his son on the altar? So, what's his illustration? You remember the story, right? Back in Genesis 22. Abraham takes his son to sacrifice Isaac, right? And he's going to go through with it. And God says, whoa, hold on. I'll provide the ram, right? And he says, your faith, your faith that God was not going to let this child stay dead, it's justified you. It's demonstrated you have a real faith, your belief in me. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was, was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So we'll stop there. Turn back to Matthew. The point there, and then Paul makes just almost the same point. And that is that faith and works go together. So if you take the much shorter passage in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 10, we all probably know verse 8 by heart, right? For you have been saved by faith, I mean saved by grace through faith. And then what comes right after that? And that's not even your own. That's a gift from God. Okay? Why? So you don't boast. Now what does he say in verse 10? You have been saved for good works. You have been predestined to be saved for good works. So the fact of the matter is, there's no tension in these two things. Jesus is not um, teaching a works-based salvation. He's showing us how we measure the authenticity of our faith. The second thing I want to emphasize, uh, and it's why I added the adjective to the word obedience, is that the measure is persistence, not perfection. Okay, the measure is persistence and not perfection. We obediently strive for perfection because we are called to be holy as God is holy, called to be perfect as he is perfect, either 1 Peter 1.14 or even in the Sermon on the Mount, I think it's verse 48 of chapter 5. So the perfection is the goal. We're not going to reach it in this life, but persistence is the measure. 
So is your life marked by a persistent effort to be obedient to God's will? Or is there something else that marks out your life? The works and the persistence of the obedience is a clear evidence. So our persistent obedience to God's will, full of failure, confession, and repentance is what sets us apart from the world. And it provides this clear evidence of a life committed to pleasing God. And then third, by the words of verse 21, Jesus is clearly establishing himself as the end times, or the big fancy theological term, the eschatological judge. That is, he is the one who determines whether or not you will spend eternity in heaven or in hell. He alone, to use that word again, is the judge. So I hope this helps resolve the tension of the inadequate measures we've talked about. Namely, that Jesus is not arguing for the absence of a profession of faith, nor is he arguing for an absence of the right content in that profession, nor is he arguing for a lack of zeal for him in living out your life of faith. None of these are excluded, but rather his emphasis is that faith, absent obedience, is not an authentic faith, which is consistent with the other witness of scripture. We saw it both in James chapter two and Ephesians chapter two also. Okay, well this brings us to our second point in verse 22, which is the response of religious unbelief. So follow along again as I read the response of religious unbelief. Verse 22, many, now notice he's jumped from every, not everyone, so he's saying there are some who will make these claims that will enter, but now he's saying many who make these claims will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name do many miracles. Now, don't be anxious about our time. These two are going to go a lot faster, 22 and 23. But 22 is amazing due to the setting. And the key to understanding the setting are these three little words. Not everyone who says to me, uh, I'm sorry, not many will say to me, here's the three words, on that day. On what day? What is Jesus talking about? Well, with these words, Jesus is referring to a day of judgment when unbelievers will be and face their final judgment. And what verse 22 is saying that a whole lot more people are going to hear these words than expected, right? He's gone from not everyone to many on that day. Now, this day is probably a reference to the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. I cannot be dogmatically sure of that, but it's open to some interpretation. interpretation. But if I'm correct, I want you to try to picture the scene here that Jesus is communicating to his audience. All unbelieving dead have been resurrected, and they're going to get their day in court. They're going to get their day in court. And each one, individually, in their turn, is going to stand before the magisterial judge, Jesus Christ. And upon hearing his verdict that they're not going to be entering the kingdom of heaven, um, they make a final appeal. And their final appeal is based upon their ministry service. Didn't we do these things? Didn't, didn't we do these? So Jesus, the magisterial perfect judge, has said, not getting in. And what do they do with him? They argue. They argue with him about being let into heaven. Okay? They make this final appeal and said, look at everything we did for you. They're so self-deceived that they think they can argue with Jesus and overturn his verdict. Or maybe I could say it this way. They're so deceived, they think they have the right to define the terms and judge whether they enter into heaven. Now look, at one time or another, 
we can all fall into this trap. It is human nature to want to think that we actually contribute something to our salvation. We don't get this idea of a quote, quote, free lunch. We want to feel like we've contributed something. And they're arguing with Jesus and essentially saying, no, you've got it all wrong. Don't you see what we did? And it's interesting that Jesus never denies the claim. He doesn't deny the valid validity of the claim. So he may even say, yeah, okay, yeah, you did those things, right? So I think the implication here is that maybe they did do those things, right? We know that. We know in the end times that demons are going to do these things, okay? But obviously there's something inadequate about their ministry efforts alone. And we find out what that is in verse 23, where we're going to see the result of religious unbelief. So follow along as we read Jesus' words again. So they've made their appeal. They're before the magisterial judge, and Jesus says, he doesn't say, no, you didn't do that. He said, no, you're wrong. No, those were worthless. He just says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So this is the terrifying result of religious unbelief. And that is to be exiled from the presence of Christ forever. This is it. This is the last judgment. You're done. It's over. There's no appeals. That's it. You're exiled from Jesus' presence forever. Despite someone's profession of faith, their right doctrine, their zeal for Christ, and their ministry works, they lacked one thing. And Jesus says the one thing that they lacked was that they didn't have a personal relationship with him. He says, I never knew you. You weren't mine. You didn't belong to me. They lacked a personal relationship with Christ. They don't belong. They were never transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. All these things that they may have done are a part of authentic faith. You have to profess Christ. You have to believe the right things about Christ. You should have a life that shows a zeal about the faith that you have. And you should be doing good works. But Jesus says, absent a relationship with him, the one who knows his sheep, you are a religious believer. And the determining factor for this condition is precisely the same measure as back up in verse 21, but stated in the negative. So notice how 23 ends. After the verdict, he says, depart from me. What? Gives the reason. Instead of doing the will of the Father in verse 21, what are they doing? They are doing the works of lawlessness, right? Or maybe we could say it this way. If a sign of authentic faith is persistent obedience, what two words would you come up with as the sign of inauthentic faith? Is persistent disobedience. Exactly right. So you see how they go perfectly together? Persistent obedience versus persistent disobedience. So in other words, their profession of the Lord, Lord, and their ministry works were merely a decoration or maybe a mask for a heart that is fundamentally and persistently opposed to God. And there's probably no better example of this in the Bible than the Pharisees and the scribes of Jesus' time. And if you remember what Jesus said to them, he pronounced woe on them, right? Right? He says, woe, and he called them whitewashed tombs. You look really good on the outside, but they were hopelessly decayed and far from him on the inside. And in fact, Jesus said this very thing earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, for I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you have to understand that in Jesus' day, this group, 
the scribes and the Pharisees would have been considered the height and the standard of religiosity. They would have been the poster children for them. But in reality, they were the poster children in Jesus' eyes and examples for religious unbelief. Thus my comment earlier, I think we'll be surprised when we see how many people are in this group. And the terrifying truth for these people is that they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, three aspects of this. There is such a thing, the reality of religious unbelief, the response of it, this arrogant arguing with Christ, that no, 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 you've got it wrong, I've got it right, let me in. And then Jesus' final verdict or result, which is no, depart from me, I never knew you, who practice lawlessness. Your persistent disobedience is the thing that demonstrates whether you really did or really didn't make a genuine profession of faith. Now I want to conclude by just pointing out the irony of religious unbelief. And it's this, those who are locked into self-deception are going to insist that they know Christ. And yet Jesus is going to say, no, I never knew you. Meaning they don't have an authentic saving faith. And this is why I think we need passages like this. So turn to Hebrews, if you would. One last verse passage, Hebrews chapter 3. This is why we need the body of Christ. This is why we come together, amongst many other reasons. And follow along as I read this. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 and 13. It's a warning. Part of the warning passages in Hebrews is see to it, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Okay, so You may be doing X, Y, Z on the outside, but make sure on the inside you don't have one of these. And then the encouragement here. But encourage one another, one of the many one another can, day after day, as long as it's still called today, meaning never lose your your zeal in this process. Um, You know, encourage one another day after day, as long as they so that, why do we do that? None of you will be hardened, hardened, By what? The deceitfulness of sin. So what is at the heart of all these things? It's self-deception. We need brothers and sisters around us that have the kindness of Galatians 6.1 to come alongside us and have the courage to say, hey, have you looked at this part of your life? And not at the same time be drawn into those kinds of sins. Okay, so... It's important that we do that. And it's important we do that because we're easily deceived and we're hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And the result is this terrifying truth that many will hear. And here's the most terrifying parts of that statement. When it's too late. Once you've heard those words, it is too late. There's no coming back. There's no changing it. It is an eternal verdict that you will be consciously aware of forever. And forever is defined as what? A long time. It's a long time. Okay? How much better if we would just take Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 2 and 3 to heart, when he says, if anyone thinks he has known anything, meaning your pride, he has not yet known as he ought to know, But here's the part I love. But if anyone loves God, he has been known by him. So here's another major measure of authentic faith. Anyone who loves God, which is why I love how Audrey shared her heart this morning. There's a genuine love, not only for God, but for those that are far from his heart. Authentic faith is not an intellectual exercise. It is a persistent obedience to God. And the first and greatest act of obedience is what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So church, as your love for God and your love for others is apparent and on display, and as you consistently strive to do the will of God His way, You can be assured. You can be assured of the authenticity of your faith. Would you pray with me?